Okay, thank you, Jennifer, and thanks to everybody that's joining us today. Uh, this is the fifth CMS Learning Lab, Increasing Access, Increasing Oral Health Through Access. And I have to tell you that we have the most registrants for this webinar as uh, compared to any of them. So obviously we've uh, created some interest out there on a topic that uh, should be near and dear to all of us when we're talking about dental sealants, an effective state strategy to prevent dental caries in children. Uh, we've often heard of things that uh, we compare to a three-legged stool. Uh, one that comes to mind most readily is you can't have fire without heat, fuel, and oxygen. Take away any of the three legs and you don't have a fire. Well, we're kind of talking about a three-legged stool when we deal with CMS now because we talk about better health, better health care, and reduced cost per patient. So what we're doing is building that three-legged stool, and we know that by uh, providing all of those things, which can be done at the same time, which is obviously a new way of thinking, but providing all those things, we truly can move forward as we increase access to care. We know that there are disproportionate levels of disease and sealant utilization when we're talking about the Medicaid population. Uh, according to the uh, GAO report from the MHEN studies from 1988 to 2004, uh, carries rates uh, for patients aged 2 to 18 uh, the carries rates for Medicaid patients have gone from 55 to 61 percent. In private insurance patients, it's gone from 50 to 45 percent, already showing a disproportionate level of disease. Specifically, when we're talking about carries rates for young children ages 2 to 5, again, the change over that time period in Medicaid is from 32 to 39 percent. In private insurance, a much lower rate of only 19 to 21 percent. And unfortunately, we see similar rate differences when we're talking about the rate of untreated caries. We have similar disproportionate levels when we're talking about sealant utilization. And again, this comes from the GAO report on the Ann Haynes studies. Uh, for those that may not be familiar, that's the National Health and Nutrition uh, Examination Survey. So when we're talking about sealant utilization, Sealant rate for ages 6 to 18, again, much lower in Medicaid, only rising to a high of 27%. Uh, private insurance, uh, raising to 40%. And for those who are uninsured in either entity, uh, we're talking about a level of 20%. So needless to say, it's showing a great disparity between those with private insurance, those with Medicaid, and especially those who are uninsured at all. Now, we, when we look specifically at sealant rate ages 6 to 11, uh, again, we're seeing the same kind of differences. Uh, Medicaid only rising as high as 22%, but private insured patients at a 36% rate of sealant utilization. Now, one of the reasons we're having this conversation today uh, deals with uh, the Form 416 and the CMS Oral Health Initiative. So just to give you a little background for those of you who may not be familiar with it, uh, the CMS Form 16 is required under the EPSDT program, Early Periodic Screening and Diagnosis and Treatment Program, and it's the information that states give to CMS on a whole list of different in indicators, uh, of which some of those are dental indicators. What we've done with the CMS Oral Health Initiative, which has now been in place for just a few years, uh, is we've targeted a couple of those data sets to be part of the Oral Health Initiative where we are asking states to improve their rates in two categories. Uh, the first one is uh, from line 12B of the Form 416, Preventive Services. And what we've asked the states to do is increase by 10 percentage points uh, those percentage of children uh, ages 1 to 20 enroll for 90 or more continuous days, uh, the percentage of children who've had a preventive service. Now, obviously, that includes uh, profies, uh, cleanings, which I learned today was a bad word, uh, but prophylaxis, fluoride treatments, and dental sealants. Now, in the oral health initiative, uh, those goals are set for preventive services, and that does include all dental sealants, whether it's primary or permanent teeth. 
Now, line 12D, which reflects the second goal of the oral health initiative, uh, talking about a 10 percentage point increase on sealants on a permanent molar for children ages nine to, excuse me, ages six to nine. Again, those enrolled for 90 or more continuous days. And in the oral health initiative, and I know I'm backing up a little bit here, uh, we've asked them to increase these by 10 percentage points, which is not the same thing as 10 percent. I know you all have heard me say this a few times, but for example, uh, if a state is at a 30 percent rate of preventive services, it doesn't mean going from 30 to 33, that would be a 10 percent increase. 10 percentage points would mean going from 30 to 40. Everyone, I think, understands now that caries in the primary dentition is a significant predictor of disease in the permanent dentition. Children are at higher risk if they have had caries, and not only caries in primary teeth, but also as they grow into adulthood and get permanent dentition. And everyone needs to remember that caries is a disease process. Uh, all too often, uh, we've talked about tooth decay and holes in teeth the cavities that people refer to, but remember that the cavity, a hole in the tooth, is just the very end of a very long, complicated disease process, a process that can be stopped, a process that can be reversed. But please understand, that hole in the tooth is not the disease. The disease process is much more basic than that. So we know that preventing caries in the primary dentition can prevent, reduce, or delay the onset of disease in permanent dentition. So what we're hearing more and more about, although it's not necessarily a new concept, is chronic disease management. Uh, this has often been com compared to a patient that had diabetes. A patient with diabetes uh, physician doesn't wait until they're ready to have a foot amputated or when they go blind. Uh, the disease is treated as a chronic disease, not waiting for the end result of the disease. So obviously the comparison to the amputated foot would be the tooth that now has a hole in it and that uh, the tooth has to be restored in a surgical process. So again, chronic disease management has been around uh, even in dental uh, for some decades, but obviously what we have not had are the uh, payment innovations and uh, the innovations that can move this forward as far as payment systems go. So there obviously are poten potential savings to Medicaid and CHIP when we're talking about dental sealants as an effective strategy. Uh, what we're going to talk about today are dental sealants in general, and we're going to feature a couple of states that cover dental sealants on primary as well as permanent molars. It's not our place at CMS to tell states what they should cover, but what we wanted to do today is to provide information uh, that you will find useful when you are determining benefits for Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries in your states. If we go to the next slide, uh, a couple, we have a couple of uh, bar charts that come to us uh, courtesy of Rob Compton at the DentiQuest Institute, and I certainly thank them for providing the information and certainly for the analysis and the data that they have. This actually comes from a single state's program, but as you look at the chart, and I know it's uh, small enough that it may be difficult to read, but what's important are to look at the different colors and the different bars. So what this shows us are the uh, dollars in millions for treatment costs by age and by tooth type. So the bars to the farther left of the chart uh, indicate primary teeth, and then as you start with ages five, six, and above, as the bars change color, those are indicating permanent teeth. So as has often been said, uh, the teeth that are indicated by the bright yellow are first permanent molars, which again, often said are the most expensive teeth in the mouth. They come in at about age five or six. Uh, we hope that they last for a lifetime uh, but if they are not put into a prevention program, uh, whatever that may mean for preventing disease, uh, they may in fact uh, start with decay, which often becomes a filling, which in later life becomes a larger filling and a larger filling. So what we obviously want to do is to prevent the decay process at its earliest stages. 
Now, if you go to the next slide, it's the same information, but now we're given an example of the treatment cost by tooth type by age. And so what we're seeing now are uh, the teeth uh, shown across the bottom scale and the ages in the different colors. So again, by far the bar chart that's the tallest is showing the permanent first molar and the ages at which that tooth is treated. So we have an opportunity with dental sealants uh, on both permanent and primary teeth. Uh, gives us an example of what can be done to prevent disease, uh, not only throughout the entire life stage, but most importantly when we're talking about Medicaid and CHIP, it's saving those teeth, uh, preventing the disease process in those children that are covered in our programs. So what we've done today is put together a panel of speakers. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, all of them at one time here, and then I will let them uh, do the uh, turnover after each session. So our first speaker is Dr. Barbara Gooch. Dr. Gooch is the Associate Director for Science in the Division of Oral Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, in Atlanta, where she serves as a senior consultant on dental public health issues, including the effectiveness of prevention strategies. She provided leadership to the CDC scientific team that reviewed evidence supporting the update of recommendations for school-based sealant programs in 2009. She also has served on the expert panel assembled by the American Dental Association Council on Scientific Affairs to develop evidence-based clinical recommendations for sealant use in 2008. Dr. Gooch currently serves on the Department of Health and Human Ser Services Federal Interagency Panel on Community Water Fluoridation. Uh, after Dr. Gooch, we're going to feature a couple of state Medicaid programs. Our next speaker will be April Burton. Uh, April is a registered dental hygienist. She graduated from Clayton State University in Atlanta, Georgia in 1996 with a Bachelor of Science in Dental Hygiene. She's been a hygienist for 17 years, and the last four have been in Medicaid management in Wyoming, where she serves as the Medicaid dental manager. Our next speaker will be Jan Paulson. Uh, Jan joined the Montana Medicaid Health Resources Division staff in 2007 after 12 years with the Public Assistance Bureau where she managed employment and training programs under the TANF block grant. Prior to that, she spent 16 years working for a community-based organization that provided vocational and residential services to developmentally disabled adults. Since coming to Medicaid services, Jan has served as the dental program officer where she supports private practice dental offices to be successful with the services to Medicaid families. She's passionate about minimizing the administrative hassles of doing business with Medicaid, ensuring the reimbursement cycle is complete and that reimbursement is minimally adequate. Jan graduated from Eastern Montana College in Billings, Montana with a Bachelor of Science degree in Related Services. As a personal note, Jan is married and has three adult children and seven grandchildren. And I love this because she says in her spare time she plays golf, and is a landlord giving her lots of opportunity to play with power tools. I'm assuming the power tools are just as a landlord and not in playing golf. Uh, we will finish up having Elizabeth Hill from CMS uh, lead the Q&A in what we call our office hour. So that means that we will be having Elizabeth moderate that session, which will be at the end of the three presentations. So again, I thank everybody for joining us today and look forward to a very successful webinar. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Gooch. Well, thank you, Lynn, and I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about evidence-based recommendations for dental sealant use. Next slide. We're going to review the recommendations and specifically six key questions that were reviewed by the expert panels that were put together uh, in the last decade to um, implement and develop these evidence-based recommendations. Then we'll look at the findings that were based on the reviews of evidence, and we'll look at the current recommendations um, that were developed. Next slide. Some of you may be asking, well, why evidence? And <clears throat> we currently have the data systems and the data available to help us when we're in an environment of constant or shrinking resources. 
And this affects not only publicly funded health care delivery programs such as you are focused on, but also public health programs at the national or federal, the state, and the local level. And basically the evidence assists us in our current environments to focus on those practices that are most effective and efficient. Evidence-based approaches uh, primarily incorporate the best available scientific evidence about what works. So in the simplest form, we're really looking for evidence that informs us about what works and what works well. And we can incorporate that information into our decision making. Next slide. Today, you may have heard of the term systematic reviews. And systematic reviews of comparative studies are the currently preferred method for identifying the available knowledge. We cast a very broad net in order to bring in all of the available studies for consideration. The systematic review is the preferred method for determining what is the best information and then summarizing it in a useful manner for generating recommendations or other policy and program considerations. The systematic review uses an explicit rule-based process, and why that's important is that process of how you undertake the review is not decided along the way, but it's actually established before the review ever begins. And it reduces bias, particularly the bias of the investigator undertaking the review. And that bias can affect the way that how you collect the information, what studies you include, and how you synthesize and report the findings. So in essence, we're trying through the systematic review to have an, ex um, an extremely rule-based and objective process. Next slide. We do depend on a hierarchy of evidence. And generally, systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized control trials are going to provide the highest level of evidence. Case reports and expert opinions are going to provide the lower level of evidence. I do want to just note that a meta-analysis is kind of an intimidating term, but it basically is a quantitative or statistical approach to combining the findings from different studies to more precisely estimate the effect of that intervention on the outcome of interest. And so in this case, in today's context, we're going to be talking about dental sealants as the intervention and tooth decay or dental caries as the outcome. Next slide. I'm going to focus on two evidence-based guidelines that Lynn alluded to in his uh, remarks. These focus on sealant use. The first one was published in 2008 in the Journal of the American Dental Association. It focuses on sealant use in clinical settings, and it was developed by an expert panel that was um, invited by the American Dental Association's Council on Scientific Affairs. The second guideline focuses on school-based sealant programs. That was published in JADA in 2009. It was developed by a work group that was supported by CDC. Next slide. We have six questions, and our first three questions are going to focus on sealant effectiveness. How does sealant, do sealants work? And they're going to provide information on the circumstances under which sealants should be placed. So question one asks, what is the effectiveness of sealants in preventing the initiation of caries? And again, caries is tooth decay. And this tooth decay is primarily on the pit and fissure surfaces. And these would be surfaces judged by the clinician, the dentist or the dental hygienist, to be sound with no signs of the decay process. And the available systematic reviews confirm that sealants are effective in preventing tooth decay, the start of tooth decay on sound surfaces. Next slide. The evidence for this is strong. The effects are of large magnitude. The most recent review that came out here in 2013 from the Cochrane collaboration indicated that the effectiveness of resin-based sealants at two years is greater than 80%. Estimates from other reviews indicate that the effectiveness is about a 60% reduction in tooth decay up to four to five years after placement. 
And based on this evidence, the American Dental Association's expert group recommended that sealants be placed on the pit and fissures of permanent teeth when it is determined that the tooth or patient is at risk of developing caries or tooth decay. Next slide. Our second question addresses what is the effectiveness of sealants in preventing the progression of early tooth decay, in essence, managing decay in its earliest stages. The, these surfaces would have the signs that you can see in the tooth in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. There would be white lines indicating loss of minerals, such as calcium, phosphate, and carbonate, yellow, brown discolorations around the pit and fissure, and also widening of the fissure area. It's important to note, however, from a clinical perspective that these early lesions have no cavitation or hole in the enamel surface. And a systematic review in 2008 found that sealants are effective in reducing the percent of non-cavitated carious lesions that progress to cavitation. So they are effective in managing early decay and slowing or eliminating that disease process so that you do not progress to a state where you have, in essence, a hole in the enamel surface and access to the, the bacteria, then having access to the softer tooth structures that are below the enamel. Next slide. These findings were reported in the Journal of Dental Research in 2008, and the conclusion was that sealants reduced the percentage of non-cavitated carious lesions that progressed by about 70% up to five years after placement. Next slide. In addition, we looked at the effectiveness of sealants in reducing bacteria levels in carious lesions. And a systematic review found that sealants also are effective in lowering bacteria levels. Next slide. And this was published in the Journal of the American Dental Association in 2008 with the conclusion that sealants lowered bacterial levels by at least a hundredfold. This result, coupled with the previous finding of sealant effectiveness in managing early non-cavitated decay, supported an ADA recommendation that pit and fissure sealants should be placed on early non-cavitated carious lesions to reduce the percentage of lesions that progress. Also, these two findings should reduce fears, particularly among clinicians, that tooth decay will progress and lead to poor outcomes if sealants are placed either knowingly or unknowingly over early decay. Next slide. The ADA also issued a recommendation related to the placement of sealants on children's primary teeth. This was based in part on the findings of sealant effectiveness in the permanent teeth, but it was also based in part on the assumption and the acceptance that sealant retention is a proxy for caries prevention. Because a sealant that is fully retained on the tooth is deemed to be effective, Based on those two key sources of, of information, one, the evidence base in permanent teeth, and two, the fact that sealants have a high retention rate based on the studies that were available at the time this was developed in 2008, the ADA made the recommendation that sealants should be placed in the pit and fissures of children's primary teeth when it is determined that the tooth or patient is at risk of developing caries. And the available studies on retention at that time indicated that more than 70% of sealants were retained on primary molars up to three years after placement. Next slide. You will note that the clinical recommendations that I just described for sealing sound pit and fissures include an assessment of risk at the level of the tooth or child. This is called caries risk assessment, and there is no universally accepted assessment tool, but I'm sure many of you are aware of the CAT, the Caries Assessment Tool, and then Canberra. Commonly used indicators across these tools in highlighting or identifying teeth or children that may be at risk are active or untreated tooth decay, 
or the signs of early decay that we have already reviewed, poor oral hygiene, low socioeconomic status, and limited use of dental services. And I'll also say not only limited but irregular use of dental services. And the carries risk assessment assists with clinical decision making and also can improve the cost effectiveness of our programs. Next slide. The evidence that we just reviewed also supported the recommendations for school-based England programs. These recommendations are to seal sound pit and fissure surfaces and to seal non-cavitated pit and fissure surfaces. Next slide. We had already um, reviewed that the American Dental Association recommendations were based on a caries risk assessment at the individual level. For school-based sealant programs, the clinician may undertake an individualized risk assessment, but there is an initial risk assessment performed at the community level, and it's performed in order to reach vulnerable children who may be at higher risk for decay and, and lower likelihood of having sealants or access to dental care. And that approach is by targeting high-risk schools. Generally, high-risk schools are identified by the percentage of students that are on the free and reduced federal meal program. We generally target programs. Of course, we do, like uh, Dr. Mountain indicated, at the federal level, we do not tell the states what to do. But we provide some guidance and, and we work closely with the states to understand how they are implementing that um, to what they consider to be an optimal approach within their local environment. Many times we focus on schools that are, have greater than 40% of their students on the free and reduced price meal program. And as I already um, stated, we know that these children, many of them are from low-income families, they're going to be at higher risk for caries and untreated tooth decay. They're going to be less likely to receive sealants and other preventive services such as clinical fluoride um, modalities, and they're also going to be less likely to receive timely dental care than children from higher income families. Next slide. Our next two questions are about preparing the tooth surface for sealant placement. And the first question asks if the addition of mechanical preparation of the enamel surface with a handpiece and burr prior to placement improves sealant retention. Now the information related to this or the studies related to this um, are few and they have limited and conflicting evidence. And at the time that, this was that we reviewed this, in, the, in 2008 and 2009, we could not determine the effect. Next slide. The second question deals with the importance of surface cleaning. You do need to clean the surface of the tooth before you place a sealant. Sorry, hold on a minute, please. Just one minute, I uh, lost the screen here. I'll be with you in just a second. The second question deals with uh, cleaning the surface of the tooth, and we are interested in two surface cleaning methods. The first is by a toothbrush, a dry toothbrush, in many cases utilized by a child under supervision by the clinician. The other method is a small brush within the dental handpiece. And the question is, do these result in similar retention rates? Well, actually, there were too few studies to determine the effect, but one clinical study suggested that there, were no, there was no difference. Next slide. In that context, we here at CDC also undertook some additional analyses looking at effectiveness studies. So these studies were not actually directly comparing surface preparation techniques, but we were able to use some approaches in order to have a better sense of how the surface preparation technique might have, might have been associated with the outcomes. And in this case, we found that toothbrushing was associated with similar, if not higher, sealant retention than cleaning with the handpiece as I had described it. Next slide. So the recommendations regarding sealant placement are that, first of all, we always need to clean the tooth surface. 
but a dry toothbrush with supervision can be used. And of course, the traditional dental handpiece with a Profi brush also can be used. Additional preparation with a dental burr was not recommended. Next slide. Our last question asks, are teeth that lose sealants at higher risk of tooth decay than teeth that were never sealed? And a meta-analysis indicated that caries risk between these two states is similar. Remember, this comparison is about teeth that lose sealants versus teeth that were never sealed. It did not look at teeth that lose sealants versus teeth that were sealed. So why is this question important? Well, it was specifically important when we were developing recommendations for school-based programs because it relates to children who are likely to miss follow-up appointments to evaluate or check the integrity and the retention of the sealants. And again, children from low-income families are documented to move and change schools more frequently than children from higher-income families. So under this scenario, if a part or all of the sealant were lost and there were no opportunity to repair or replace the sealant, would we be placing the tooth and thus the child at increased risk for tooth decay compared to not placing the sealant at all? In essence, if you could not assure that you could evaluate that sealant in a year's time or in a normal recall pattern, should you not place the sealant? Findings of this systematic review, however, indicated that the caries risk is the same between teeth that lose sealants either fully or partially and teeth that were never sealed. Next slide. And these results were published in JADA, again, in 2008 or 2009. Next slide. The ADA clinical recommendation based in part on those findings were to monitor and reapply sealants as needed to maximize effectiveness. But we still recognize that effectiveness of sealants has been well documented among groups of children even when those sealants were not reevaluated over time and when there was only one time placement of sealants. Next slide. For school-based programs, we do seal the teeth of children even if follow-up cannot be assured. Next slide. So some of the key messages uh, from this short talk has been that evidence supports the effectiveness of sealant use, both in clinical care settings and in school sealant programs. CDC and ADA recommendations are consistent on the topics addressed by both, and caries risk assessment is recommended at the individual level prior to placing sealants on sound services in clinical settings, and the caries risk assessment may be at the individual level in school settings, but is at the community level in order to identify and to reach those students who are likely in need of sealant placement and evaluate oral evaluations. So I thank you for your time. Next slide. And I'd like to turn the presentation over to April Burton of Wyoming Medicaid. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gooch. I would like to first talk about the history of our program related to sealants. Um, prior to 2008, Wyoming Medicaid covered sealants on permanent posterior teeth only. And this did include permanent molars and premolars. In 2008, Wyoming Medicaid added primary second molars, A, J, K, and T, to the list of teeth covered for sealant. And then in 2010, during a, re a budget reduction request, it was determined that sealants on bicuspids would be cut from our program. The Medicaid Advisory Group supported this decision after lengthy discussions on the benefit versus the cost on sealing these teeth. We were proposing to see about a $200,000 savings by cutting the sealants on the bicuspid teeth. We also monitor the amount being spent on one surface fillings for bicuspids to see if this amount is increasing due to these teeth not being sealed. We have not had any increases since 2010 and in fact have seen a decline from about 63,000 spent in 2010 on one surface fillings 
to about 47,000 spent in 2013 on these fillings. Next slide. The addition of primary second molars was based on a recommendation um, and the guidelines by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. They stated that any tooth, including primary teeth and permanent teeth, other than molars, may benefit from sealant application due to the anatomy and the caries risk factor. And also that caries risk may increase at any time during a patient's life. We also had encouragement from our Wyoming Dental Association and from the Dental Hygiene Association to increase our preventive services at that time. Next slide. Now I'll talk about our policy. Um, currently, the Wyoming Medicaid sealant policy is that we pay for the application of dental sealants for permanent molar teeth and primary second molars, AJK and T. Sealants are allowed once in an 18-month period for each covered tooth for clients ages 0 to 20. And each sealant is reimbursed at $28. This fee is based on Wyoming's methodology for pricing dental codes. We price our dental codes at 75% of the average bill charge for sealants by Wyoming dentists. This was established in 2008. Next slide. This shows a cost to our Medicaid program over a five-year period of time. From 2008 through 2012, we have estimated that there was 10,018 sealants placed on AJK and T and the cost to our program was $280,000. What we've tried to do is figure out the potential cost avoidance of one surface fillings on these teeth. So we did an, just an estimate, and we used a 50% to say that there's the potential for 50% of these teeth that were not sealed to potentially have a one surface filling placed. At $78 per one surface filling reimbursement, there was approximately half would be $390,000 to our program. If we have avoided the cost of fillings on at least half of these teeth, then we feel this benefit benefits our program with cost avoidance and better oral health in our children. Next slide. This slide is going to show us the percentage of kids that received a sealant versus the kid, percentage of kids that received a filling. So what we hope is that as we increase the number of sealants that we're placing, that we're going to see a decrease in the number of one-surface fillings. We are actually beginning to see a decline in the number of one-surface fillings being done on these, on these particular teeth, A, J, K, and T. We will continue to monitor this trend and assess if we are truly reducing the number of fillings needed by paying for sealants on A, J, K, and T. The decline in sealant placement from 2011 to 2012 is attributed to lower enrollment of new Medicaid clients. Next slide, please. To understand the decline in sealant placement from 2011 to 2012, we have to look at the percentage of newly eligible clients. So from 2008 to 2009, we had approximately 3,170 new clients that were eligible for sealant. As you can see, in 2011 to 2012, we only had 313 clients. Therefore, there's less teeth to be sealed. Next slide. Wyoming's Medicaid's policy to reimburse providers for sealants placed on primary teeth, um, we feel benefits our program by three different ways. With preventing costly restorative treatment, if our client's teeth can be protected, we can realize a savings to our program and offer our clients better oral health. We're also protecting our children from potential dental emergencies. Unprotected teeth are susceptible to decay, and if this decay progresses untreated, there is a potential for a dental emergency. We also want to are maintaining the health of primary molars for space maintenance, the potential prevention for orth orthodontic cases later. When primary molars are lost prematurely, there can be a shift in the dentition that otherwise would not have happened. This can increase the chance 
of a more severe malocclusion. Next slide, please. With implementation of sealant coverage on primary second molars in 2008, Wyoming has seen about three years of decline in the number of one-surface occlusal fillings being done. We will continue to monitor this decline and the potential savings to our program. Now I'll turn it over to Jan Paulson with Montana Medicaid. Thank you, April. This is Jan Paulson from uh, Montana Medicaid. Uh, next slide, please. In Montana, our dental sealant policy is based on the ADA evidence-based clinical recommendations of the use of Pitt and Fisher sealants published in 2008. Montana reimburses procedure code D1351 on first and second molars in the primary and permanent arch. To the right of your screen is an illustration of both those arches. We pay for tooth letters A, B, I, J, K, L, S, T. And in the permanent dentition, in the permanent arch, we pay tooth numbers 2, 3, 14, 15, 18, 19, 30, and 31. And these um, tooth letters and numbers are paid through age 20. Next slide, please. Other influencing factors that assisted us in making the change in our policy was the, the new practice standard brought to our attention from many local dentists within our state. We're strong partners with the Montana Dental Association and we value their professional recommendations. Uh, also in discussion was the cost of sealants paired with the future savings that would be realized with implementing this comprehensive dental sealant policy made the right decision for Montana. Under the EPSDT program guidance, states have the authority to provide services that are determined medically necessary. We believe that early intervention means starting with primary teeth and we believe prevention involves both primary and permanent teeth. Next slide, please. We reviewed the eruption chart that um, is presented on the right side of your screen. Eruption means when the tooth comes in and shed means when the tooth falls out. Um, the chart on the right will give you the eruption schedule in months. I converted that to years, and we, we did a review of first and second molars, when they came in and when they fell out. And you can see there's a range in uh, years there. Uh, everyone has their own individual differences. But, but when we looked at that schedule, we really took a look at how long the molar was actually in, and meaning how long it was affected by bacteria. And, and we see that the primary first molars are, are in almost you know, seven to 10 years, second molars approximately the same. That, then when they shed and the permanent teeth come in, um, approximately age seven, second molars are, are a higher age, age 12, they're there for the rest of their life. But those primary molars are potentially in for eight to nine years. So that is a long time um, to potentially grow into some problems. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the age group breakdown as we see in our CMS 416 report. And as you know, we report numbers to CMS uh, beginning with the age group of 6 through 9 and then again age 10 through 14. We, I, I, I took the previous chart of the 
eruption and shedding chart and applied it to these age groups. And you see with age one through two is when the primary first molar comes in. Age three to five, primi primary molar comes out. And age six to nine, the primary fallout and the permanent come in. Age 10 through 14, that permanent molar comes in. In Montana, we, since we've been sealing teeth, um, the data here represents state fiscal year 2012, we, we sealed 411 kids in that early age one to two group. That was 1,463 sealants. Um, uh, age three to five, we sealed 1,259 kids with 3,976 sealants. Then when we get to the older ages, six through nine, we sealed 1,814 kids with 5,926 sealants. Age 10 to 14, we sealed 1,256 kids with 3,930 sealants. What you can see is you, you, you hit a peak year at some point, of course, depending upon um, when you start your program. And a April Burton from Wyoming illustrated this as well. Once you get the molars sealed, they're likely to last. Um, for for many years, and, and and you see the activity leveling off, and that's what this is beginning to demonstrate as well. Next slide, please. So we hypothetically projected out what if we wouldn't have provided the sealants. So in state fiscal year, we provided 15,885 sealants in total. If we would have, and that's basically an average of three per person, if, if we wouldn't have had those three sealants per person, and we would have had at least one filling per person or one stainless steel crown per person, we would have spent a lot of money. We potentially, and this is a very much an underestimate estimate, we would have potentially spent $665,000 in fillings with one per person, uh, $779,000 with one stainless steel crown per person. Um, this is across our full EPSDT age range um, with a total of 78,000 total eligibles. So you, you can see that the cost avoidance is fairly high compared to the 392000 that we did spend. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the cost per person to prevent decay ranged from $25 to $200 uh, for the application of uh, one to eight sealants. The cost to treat decay ranged from $65 to $200 per tooth up to $520 to $1,600 for all eight molars. Sealants are clearly effective in reducing occlusal caries in children, adolescents, and adults. The cost of preventing decay is dwarfed when looking at the cost of treating decay. Next slide, please. So what's happening in Big Sky Country in the future is um, we're going to continue with our partnership with the Montana Dental Association. Uh, it's a very positive partnership and grows every year. Uh, we currently are working on a project with them uh, called Who's My Dentist? And um, it's a great campaign. Uh, they, they feature a website, whosmydentist.com, and it um, educates families of children to establish a dental home by age one, schedule regular dental appointments every six months, um, have a healthy, nutritious diet, teach your children to brush your teeth twice a day, 
uh, have a dental team, play sealants, get a mouth guard for sports, uh, et cetera. So, so that's a, a great project that we've teamed up with our Montana Dental Association. We uh, provide ongoing outreach to new dental providers to expand our, our network within the state. We provide uh, training each spring and fall to strengthen our current providers. We send out annual letters to families informing them of services available. We support school-based dental sealant programs, which has a real strong start in Montana. We support the practice standard of getting kids to the dentist by age one with our Access to Baby and Child Dentistry program. We, we encourage families to have a dental home, and we provide transportation reimbursement if families need to travel out of town for services. And uh, at this time, I would like to pass off to Elizabeth. Great. So thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, and so now we'll um, answer a few questions that have come in. And everyone who's listening, feel, please feel free to submit your questions um, through the Q&A box. Um, I think our first question will be for Dr. Mountain. Um, Dr. Mountain, um, the CMS Oral Health Initiative is um, a 10 percentage point increase over what period of time? I'm sorry, I obviously forgot to mention that. Uh, although originally designed to be over a five-year period, the baselines were just set this last year. But we are still asking the state to please work toward this goal uh, by 2015. Okay, and I think we had um, another, another question for, for CMS. Um, does CMS break out the number of profies from fluoride varnish and sealants? And what evidence is used to support rubber cup profi as a preventive service? Okay, uh, first of all, we do not break it out at CMS, although a state may, may be able to provide that information on profis uh, as, as separate uh, procedures from fluoride varnish, uh, because what we have reported to CMS on the, line, on the form 416 is preventive services uh, as a, I hate to say bundled, but as, as a uh, separate way of doing it without breaking up the different treatment episodes. Um, the evidence for rubber cup profies uh, may not be very strong for preventive effects in young children. Uh, however, we do know that the provision of a range of preventive services does provide an opportunity for examination and assessment of a child's dental or skeletal development and the risk for dental caries. Okay, thank you. Um, Barbara, I think this next question is for you. Um, is the caries risk assessment recommended in the school-based setting? Well, I, I tried to address that, and let me just um, address it one more time in that we emphasize in school-based settings from the recommendations that were supported here at CDC that all children that have parental consent forms and have molars are our primary focus there. We're not saying they, it can't extend to primary molars, but our permanent molars, we always want to make sure that that first permanent molar in the younger grades of the school-based program receives priority. If that tooth is erupted suitably to be sealed, then because we're targeting schools that have high numbers of vulnerable children, we do, we do not undertake generally an individualized risk assessment, but would seal all of those teeth that are suitable for sealing. Now, of course, the child would have had re to return a parental consent form and parents may indeed have discussed this with their own dentist, et cetera. But the other reason we offer to all children and also seal all of the teeth that are suitable or meet the parameters for sealing is that first we don't want to separate children out on who's, in this, who's able to be sealed by the sealant program and who isn't. And secondly, we have this preventive opportunity. A child is there 
in the program, perhaps in the dental chair. Many times these are portable dental units with personnel. Everything's set to place the sealant. And so the overall recommendation is to go ahead and place that sealant in the child. Now, if you have a very, even if we're in a school that has a high percentage of children um, who are on the free and reduced price meal program, indicating that they're in the income group that appears to have higher risk of caries, it may be that in the local area the caries risk is quite low. In that case, the program has, can have its own policy and its own recommendation based on its local environment that, yes, a caries risk assessment can be undertaken. But our overall recommendation from the federal level is if you have a child in the program with a parental consent and the child appears uh, on the day that the program is sealed in the school to go ahead and seal those molars because you're, you might otherwise miss a preventive opportunity with that child. So there are a number of caveats, but I hope that the final result was clear. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for you is, um, does the CDC or the ADA recommend one kind of sealant material over another? Well, CDC does not. We would rely on the Food and Drug Administration, another federal agency. If they've cleared a sealant material for marketing in the U.S., then we would defer to that to FDA, and also we would advise the practitioner to follow the instructions for use for that sealant material. The ADA, as you may or may not know, in 2008 did, based on the available evidence, conclude that glass ionomer cement, and they were limiting it to glass ionomer cement, and I do not think that there were studies available with the resin modified glass ionomer. Glass ionomer cement may be used as an interim preventive agent when there are indications for placement of a resin-based sealant, but concerns about moisture control may compromise such placement. Now, I do want to highlight um, some recent evidence that's come out from the Cochrane Review. The most recent Cochrane Review certainly has a strong evidence base for resin-based sealants. The comparison of glass ionomer sealant to no sealant at all, there are very few studies of that, and one reason is that since the 1980s, the, um, the uh, focus on not placing a sealant at all was considered to have some lack of ethics since we knew and have strong evidence that sealant placement is effective. So, the glass ionomer sealant compared to no sealant, there are very few studies. There are more studies that compare glass ionomer sealant to resin-based sealants, but the unfortunate, well, the fortunate part for the population is that carries risk in the, stu in the study samples was very low. There were very low incidence of caries and any other type of event related to tooth decay. So, there really was insufficient evidence to make any conclusion because we weren't dealing or these studies were not focused on a population at higher caries risk. So at this time, I want you all to realize that the studies that supported resin-based sealants were done primarily in the 1970s and some in the 1980s, and resin-based sealants has a very strong evidence base for effectiveness in a higher caries population. When you're focusing on a low-risk population, you will not see that same level of effectiveness because the control group, the children who aren't receiving sealants, are not um, developing caries. So there is this interplay between caries risk and effectiveness. Now, the last, my last statement has to do with assessing caries risk. We do have models. Uh, CDC has certainly advocated uh, caries risk assessment, even in terms of the application of um, topical fluoride and the prescription of uh, fluoride supplements. But the models that we have really have not been validated. A recent review by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force could not find any evidence that related caries risk assessment to better outcomes in children in terms of oral health. So we have to work with the tools we have. 
We have to understand that the studies to determine whether carrier's risk assessment makes a difference in outcomes are hard to initiate and to carry out over the long term. So we work uh, with a, a rationale, a theoretical rationale, and we do use carrier's risk assessment because we know that carrier's risk across the population has decreased. But sometimes that lower carrier's risk can um, somewhat inhibit or hamper our need to learn more about the effectiveness of materials, and that's what's also what's happened with glass ionomer sealants. So while we have a very strong evidence base, I'll emphasize that again for resin-based, not so strong for glass ionomer sealants, but they have been tested in more recent time periods where the carries uh, incidence is lower. So that's a long answer. I hope <laughs> I hope that there were some take-home messages from that. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think this next question is for Jan and April. Um, how are the provider network expansions progressing in Montana and Wyoming in light of the increasing numbers of Medicaid beneficiaries? So, Jan, you want me to go first? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so in, in Wyoming, we have, um, this year, they have not decided to expand Medicaid um, within Wyoming. However, we are diligently recruiting um, all the time and trying to expand our network. Um, we currently have a, approximately 90% of our practicing dentists within the state participating in Medicaid. So we've only identified um, a very few amount of practicing dentists in our state that are not enrolled to be Medicaid providers. So we're always trying to recruit those people and we're also trying to um, make sure that the providers that we do have enrolled are actively seeing our patients and, and trying to take on more in their areas. In Montana, our legislature um, also decided not to expand Medicaid. Um, we, uh, we've seen a small rise in our number of beneficiaries, um, not, not real huge. Our population of dental providers has grown slowly as well, and many of them have defined limits as to how many um, new Medicaid patients they can accept, whether it be between the CHIP program or Medicaid. Um, we, we, we've seen over the recent years a direct correlation with the downturn in the economy um, with increased chair time available for for our Medicaid beneficiaries. So we're, we're doing well and um, we're doing what we can to reduce the administrative burden of doing business with Medicaid and providing the level of support that, that we can. Our network is, is very active, probably 450 providers. I think in Montana there may be as many as 600. So. So we have much of them and um, have a strong relationship with their offices. Great, thanks. And Jan, this, ne this next question is for you. Um, how has um, the access to sealants been improved by using um, Montana's collaborative care um, for the registered dental hygienists? Are they reimbursed like dentists? It, they can. What what we have in Montana is for the ability of a uh, hygienist to have a limited access permit um, to operate independently um, when associated with a public health clinic, um, an FQHC, and um, that is their backup dental office, from there they can, once they have the access permit, they can um, go to Head Start, they can go to schools, they can go to nursing homes and provide a short list of preventative services. We reimburse them the same rate as we reimburse dentists, um, but, but much of our hygienists um, and especially with our school-based programs, travel with a, um, 
a dentist in an employee-employer relationship. Thank you. Um, and we'll go back to Barbara. Barbara, could you describe the state of the evidence for placing sealants on primary molars? Well, I actually alluded to that, that if we searched the literature uh, in preparation for this particular presentation, and really there, is very, there are very few studies that have focused on sealant use in the primary teeth. And the ADA undertook a review through 2008, and <clears throat> there were no studies of effectiveness of sealants on the primary teeth, but there were studies of retention of, in this case, I believe they were resin-based sealants on the primary teeth, and that retention rate was good. And so based on that, and based on the fact that sealants are certainly documented to be effective in the permanent teeth, the ADA did make the recommendation that sealants can be placed or should be placed on primary teeth when it's indicated that either the tooth or the child is at risk. And if you're dealing with a Medicaid population, then certainly at the child and at the community level, one could argue that the child is at, is at risk compared to other groups of children. The evidence is very limited for specifically examining sealant use on primary teeth. Okay, thank you. And I think actually this next question is for you too. Um, is a caries risk assessment recommended in the school-based setting? No. In the school-based setting, from the recommendations that CDC reported, the risk assessment is done at the community level. And it's done, again, I'll just focus on the identifying and placing school sealant programs in those schools that have higher percentages of children on the free and reduced price meal program. By doing that, we reach children who are probably much less likely to have sealants and much less likely to have access to regular dental care. There actually was, uh, were two studies done in Ohio that showed that when you uh, placed a sealant program in schools, uh, differences within the school between kids who, between children who were from wealthier families versus poorer families, and there are proxies for that. We obviously don't ask the children that, but in terms of how many are on the free and reduced price meal program, how many are insured by Medicaid, how many are uninsured, some of those differences between children in terms of receipt of sealants began to decline and in some cases disappeared. So sealant programs are a great equalizer in terms of making sure that all children within one, a, one school or a group of schools has access and can use and benefit from dental sealants. So no, we do not recommend an individualized risk assessment. However, going back to my earlier comment that from the federal level, it's, we don't we don't tell um, our practitioners or our personnel at the state and local level what they should do. We make recommendations and we provide the evidence and then in the context of their professional judgment, their assessment of the child, et cetera, they make the determination of what is the appropriate course of action. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is back to um, Jan and April. Um, for both of your states, does Medicaid fund school-based sealant programs in, in your states? In Montana, we, the Medicaid uh, office does not specifically fund the school-based program as a whole. Um, it, the staff who, I suppose, manage the clinic, they need to file a claim on behalf of each individual student that they served. April, did you want to answer the question? Yeah, yeah Wyoming doesn't currently have a school-based sealant program. Okay. Um, so I guess the next question will be for, for Barbara. Um, what does the available evidence say about the positive or negative effects Oh, actually, I'm sorry, that question has been answered. Um, 
so back, back to Jan. In school-based programs, who is eligible to bill Medicaid? Are dentists placing the sealants or are they being used in a supervising capacity? Yes, it, the dentists who are uh, over the clinic, it's usually a local dentist, um, can provide, can submit a claim. The place of service, whether it be the office, a mobile unit or a school-based setting, um, we, don't, we don't place limits on place of service. But the provider does need to be enrolled with Medicaid, and of course the student needs to be Medicaid eligible. And um, it, it's kind of a paperwork nightmare um, for the clinics because you know, you got to figure out who is and who isn't, and you know, and then they also are billing other insurers as well. And um, does your state have have a mid level provider that can bill for procedures in a public health setting? Well, the um, registered hygienists who have a limited access permit would would be able to do that. And okay. that is part of their um, licensing, um, cer you know, certifications with the Department of Labor. Okay. Elizabeth, this is April in Wyoming. And yes. I just wanted to go back and elaborate a little bit on not having a school-based sealant program. Um, but what we do have is we have a public health program um, that will pay reimburse dentists um, directly for sealant placement on children who um, either are Medicaid patients who need bicuspid sealants um, or are children that are uninsured um, that need sealants. So we do have that program in place. However, it's not a school-based program. Okay, thank you. Um, and then another question for, um, for Barbara. Um, how long do, do sealants last, and is there an average time for sealant retention? Well, actually, one of the best reviews of that came in the Surgeon General's report, which was uh, published in 2001, but that's been one of the most comprehensive reviews. It was reported that 92 to 96 percent retention in second-generation resin-based sealants after one year and then 67 to 82% retention after five years. There was a longer-term study um, published in 1993, which is old now, again looking at second-generation resin-based sealants, and they found a long-term retention of 41 to 57% intact after 10 years. So retention of resin-based sealants when they are uh, placed with technical skill and um, adherence to the uh, meticulous technique that is needed and certainly have a moisture-free uh, operating field, the retention is quite high. Thank you. And then, again, another question for Jan. Um, I understand that Montana, Montana pays for a dental visit every six months. Can visits occur more often for children at greater risk of childhood caries? Yes, they can. Under the EPSDT uh, guidelines, if it's determined medically necessary um, through their medical chart at the dental office, through the result of a caries risk assessment, whatever method is used to document the extra need, it can be provided, um, you know, up to six times a year if need be. Okay, thank you. And again, another question for, for Barbara. Um, the study argues that handpiece spur does not improve retention after brushing. Can you comment on handpiece spur cleaning of fissures versus brushing the surface with regard to retention? Well, I just kind of wanted to clarify that. Uh, there are two separate questions there. One is about cleaning. And the question for us, and I'll give you the background, was that in cleaning the two surface, some school-based programs, and actually most school-based programs, rely on dry toothbrush 
tooth, tooth brushing of the surface by the child and that's supervised as really as they're awaiting sealant placement. But remember, once they are seated in the dental chair, the um, high velocity air water syringe is used to rinse off that tooth prior to acid etching, etc. The other um, more standard modality in uh, dental office where you're providing comprehensive services, et cetera, and you're not focused solely on the provision of preventive services such as sealants or fluoride varnish, et cetera, is to use a handpiece, the traditional handpiece prophylaxis that in many cases the dental hygienist provides uh, during your dental cleaning. And so I, usually it would use a pumice or it may use a, a dry brush slowly in the grooves, but they, they use the slow speed handpiece. That's difficult in school-based programs because our current recommendations at CDC for infection control are that if you use the handpiece, including the slow speed angle, you're going to need to sterilize that between every child. So the other approach using the toothbrush it was very important for these school-based recommendations that we really carefully look at the evidence because there were concerns that we might be hindering or reducing sealant retention and effectiveness by not using the traditional cleaning with the handpiece and the profi brush. But our findings did not um, reveal that. And there have been just a couple of clinical studies, one in particular by Gilchrist. They did not find a difference between using the handpiece and using the brush. So that was important for us. That has to do with cleaning the surface prior to placing the sealant. The burr in the dental handpiece is an additional step that sometimes, uh, I'm a dentist, I know Lynn's a dentist and other on, others on the phone are, sometimes we're, we're trained that when we see areas of the enamel that, may, that look like they may be affected by caries, say, or may appear not to be, not to be um, ideal for an acid etch, which the acid etch, of course, removes the mineral and then allows a physical bond with the sealant material. Um, when that seems to be compromised, there had been some thought that you could do what's termed an enamelplasty and that that might improve retention of the sealants and the marginal seal. But we really have no evidence that that is the case. And so, again, for sealant programs, that's important because once more having to introduce a high-speed handpiece into a school-based program for something or for a technique that may uh, be used in a fixed dental office with uh, comprehensive care, it was not feasible and it turned out that it was not needed within the school-based program. So there's two different stages here. One was the cleaning using the traditional handpiece and profi brush versus the toothbrush. The second phase was the enamelplasty. And so that's the evidence related to those two steps. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think actually I'm going to turn the floor back over to Dr. Mountain. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I do see that there's uh, one last question before we close, and somebody has asked that we discuss the uh, Medicaid free care rule and what it means for school based sealant programs. Um, free care rule, we'll put that in quotes, and actually the quote should be around no free care rule. Uh, because it's uh, widely thought that you can't provide services uh, for free unless everybody is getting them for free. So you can't provide them for free to one person but then bill Medicaid. This obviously is an issue in school-based dental sealant programs and, and in other settings, and there are considerable uh, internal conversations going on at CMS uh, to provide better guidance. So I, I hope that answers it by, frankly, not providing much of an answer at this time, but stay tuned. So needless to say, this has been a, a great afternoon. I uh, certainly appreciate all the people that uh, were with us throughout, uh, those that are sticking with us. Uh, I certainly want to thank uh, all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Gooch, uh, Jan Paulson, and uh, April Burton uh, for wonderful presentations. Uh, thank you to Elizabeth for uh, moder moderating the question and answer period, 
and also to our friends at the Medicaid Chip State Dental Association, uh, who not only co-brand these webinars, uh, but also the impetus of this particular webinar came from the folks at MISDA. So I certainly want to give them a big shout out, as they say. So thank you again to everybody for participating today, and we will be in touch about the next quarterly webinar as soon as possible. Thanks again.